The story of Jesus is our journey together through the Gospels in order to understand the life of the most remarkable man in all of history, the God-man, who lived a perfect life and gave himself for our salvation. Understanding Jesus means that we must look at his external life, which can be seen in his actions, and his internal life, which can be seen through his prayers. Many of us pray in Jesus' name without even thinking about it. But have you ever considered what it would mean to pray in Jesus' way? His own disciples heard their Lord praying and were so compelled by the heart and the passion of his prayer that they begged Jesus to teach them to pray in the same way. Jesus responded to their request by telling them to approach God as a loving Father. And he taught them the model that we have come to call the Lord's Prayer. In both his teaching and his own prayer life, Jesus showed us that the goal of prayer for the Christian is not about getting the technique right or about getting things from God. The purpose of prayer for the Christian is to know God. Throughout his earthly life, Jesus demonstrated that the internal life of prayer is to be intimately connected to the external life of loving others. In Luke chapter 5, we saw Jesus heal a leper with his touch. The touch of Jesus can make a person clean and whole. In the very next story, Luke tells, Jesus heals a paralyzed man who was carried to him by his four friends. Between these two stories, Luke tells us that despite the crowds and the growing demands on Jesus' time, he often withdrew to seek his father in prayer. The healing of the leper and the paralytic together give us a good picture of our true condition because of our own sin. We are unclean, cut off from God, and totally helpless to change ourselves apart from Jesus. This is really what all of the healing miracles in the New Testament are about. All of the physical healings are meant to show us that Jesus has the power and authority to forgive our sin and heal us spiritually. They are pointing us to the greatest miracle of all, the miracle of the cross and the empty tomb. And this is precisely where the next stage of our journey through the story of Jesus is going to take us. Are you ready? As you saw on the video, that recaps the last two series we've been in. And if you happen to be visiting with us and you're new, then I uh, want to let you know we're in a year-long study called The Story of Jesus, tracing not just chronologically, but the major movements or events of his life. The last two series have been about the prayer life of Jesus and his teaching on prayer and the miracles, particularly the healing miracles of Jesus. We come now to a series called Behold the Man. That's a phrase taken from Pilate's words about Jesus when he presented him to the crowds before his crucifixion. And this series will lead us right up until Easter Sunday. We're very excited yeah, that you're here with us and to be digging into this part of his life, perhaps the most important part of the life of Christ as we study together. Sometimes when you read through uh, the gospel accounts, I don't know if you're like me, I like to imagine that I'm there, put myself in the story. It helps me to uh, realize these are not just made up stories, this is real history, real people, real flesh and blood. And sometimes I even like to project like a modern, um, like try to tell the story from a perspective that we, we would understand. You read the story as if it were, say, a news account. You know, you watch the news, and there's always somebody live on the scene, and they're uh, telling you what's going on, and there's stuff happening behind them. I particularly like to go on YouTube and see the funny ones where people are reporting on this, and, then, and a wave knocks them over or something funny like that. But anyway, so I'm going to read to you a made-up account of a story that we're going to look at in depth together, as if it's a reporter and somebody uh, they're interviewing live on the scene. Hello, everyone. This is Jeff Frazier reporting live from Jerusalem, Israel. With me is a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. The ruling religious body here in the Holy City. Sir, can you give us your impressions of the situation here? Yes, I'd be glad to. First, on Sunday, the popular but unofficial Rabbi Jesus unexpectedly paraded into town on a donkey. Can you believe that? What a scene. People were going crazy, throwing their garments in the streets, shouting messianic slogans. It was quite a ruckus. They were saying things like, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we were shocked. It bordered on blasphemy, you know. We told him to tell his religious followers to be quiet, but he told us that if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. Clearly, the man has delusions of grandeur. Not only that, he's emotionally unstable. 
right in the middle of this acclaim, he broke down weeping and babbling something about us not recognizing the day of our visitation. We hoped it would all blow over. It usually does, you know, as it has in the past. But there seems to be an unusual fervor in town right now. Everyone is talking about the possibility that this Galilean carpenter, an unofficial rabbi, mind you, that he might actually be the Messiah, who I might point out to you has never even been to a rabbinical school, has never even had the proper teachers, has no official status. Can you imagine a Messiah from Nazareth? I mean, everyone knows, of course, that he will be from Bethlehem of the lineage of David. Something has to be done. Well, what is it you plan to do? Yesterday, he came into the temple on a rampage, overturned the tables of the temple, uh, the legitimate, properly licensed vendors there, and drove them all away. I told you he's emotionally unstable. He can't even control his temper. No rabbi would act this way. And then he sets himself up in the temple as a preacher and teacher, and the crowds are flocking to him. Well, it's obvious then that this is getting out of hand. What is the Sanhedrin going to do about it? Well, we called a caucus together and decided that at this point we need to make a cautious approach. These kinds of situations with a volatile crowd, they can blow up in your face, you know, if you're not careful. It's clear this man is not operating under a legit legitimate authority. The high priest is our duly appointed authority, and he licenses all the vendors, oversees all religious matters in our nation. He makes sure that those who teach in the temple are properly approved. So we figure that if we let the crowd know that he's not legitimate, that he doesn't have the proper authority, then they'll stop listening to him. Well, thanks for your time. That's the situation here in Jerusalem, folks. We'll keep you posted on any more developments. You know, in my head, that was better than it was when I was actually reading it. Uh, I'd like to now read to you Luke's account of what actually takes place. Maybe you know where we're going with this. Maybe you know the story uh, now that you've heard me do that little, little intro. Maybe you know the story. Maybe you don't. But if you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 20. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. This is how they respond to the issue of Jesus in the holy city. Now, Jesus has been to Jerusalem before, but this is what will come to be the last week of his life. This is day three in the last week of the life of Jesus. He's in the temple and he's teaching. Let's read uh, Luke 20, verses 1 through 8. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us, by what authority you do these things, or who it is that gave you this authority? He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he'll say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Perhaps you've heard this story before. It's really a fascinating account if we, as we dig into it. Let me give you a little background here into the story so you can set the scene in your own mind, uh, if you will. The confrontation takes place in the temple. Now, I don't know what comes in your mind when you think about the temple. And perhaps you think about indoor, like a church building. They're locked up in a, in a church basement somewhere or in the sanctuary. That's not, this is not an indoor scene. But if you've ever been to Jerusalem uh, uh, in, in Israel, the temple mount is a massive structure. You'll see here an image on the screen uh, of a, mo uh, a scale model. See the people in the background there? You can walk around this model of the city of Israel in Jesus' day. It's, it's, this is a museum in Israel, the National Israeli Museum. It's really an amazing thing. They built the scale model of the of city of Israel in Jesus' day. That large, massive structure in the foreground is the Temple Mount. The temple proper is the building inside of it with that tall building sticking up in the middle. That's the Holy of Holies. You've heard about that, right? Where only the high priest could enter. Right outside that on the steps was the altar where the priests sacrificed animals for the sins of the people. But you see that whole massive structure is called the temple. Over there on the far left side is the southern steps of the temple, referred to as Solomon's porch, where the early church met. Large, only place they could meet that would gather that many people outside like that. And that, that red po uh, roofed porch there, you see those? And those columned porches around the outside, that's where the money changers were. That's where the people selling animals and changing money for temple taxes were. That's where Jesus drove them out of. That's where he cleared it uh, of, of of the people that he thought were robbing God's people. Most likely, his teaching happened in those open area courts there, called the Court of Gentiles. Anybody could go up there. Uh, but there were people that patrolled, temple guards, elders, chief priests, that sort of patrolled, making sure that everybody was keeping the peace and nothing inappropriate was going on. That's where Jesus was. This, by the way, this structure is over 10 stories high. Just the wall in Herod's day. Herod the Great built this temple, uh, well, expanded it, the third temple, if you will. 
He, it looks over 10 stories high, the outer wall. It covers uh, an area of 144,000 square meters. That's over 20 football fields inside those courts. It's really a remarkable structure. Today, if you go up there, where that, the actual temple proper is, the Holy of Holies, who knows what's there? The Dome of the Rock, a Muslim mosque or monument is on that place because there's a dispute today over who has the right to be up there. So physically, socially, spiritually, economically, this structure right there is the center of life in Israel, in Jerusalem. It's everything to the people. Jesus did most of his teaching in those courts when he was in the holy city. The whole incident with the Jewish leaders that we just read about is about authority. Who has authority? The question of authority. Authority is a strong word. I can't help thinking of the John Cougar Mellencamp song, when I fight authority, authority always wins. Or maybe you think about cop shows, police shows, you know? There's like a hostage situation, and somebody shows up who's like from the FBI and says, who's in charge here, right? And they take over authority. You don't have jurisdiction anymore. I love that part of the, of the show. I don't think in real life that ever happens that way, but it happens in every police show. It's position and power to set the rules and to enforce the rules when we think about authority. In Jerusalem of Jesus' day, and by the way, in Jerusalem still today, Authority is a big deal. It's still a hotly debated issue. In fact, you know that from the, uh, the, the Seven Days War, uh, Israel gave up control of the Temple Mount. It's under, it's under Jordanian Muslim control, the Temple Mount. Everything else is Israeli control in Jerusalem. So you, can, you have to go up there, you have to go through Jordanian security. They're still, they're still debating today who has authority in that place. In Jesus' day, there were two authority structures at play in Jerusalem and in Israel. Number one was Rome. Of course you know about that. But number two was what was referred to as the Sanhedrin, a council of 71 members, 70 plus one, the high priest. If you can go back to the image of the temple again, do you mind doing that? Can you flip back to that image? So if you look to the right, right hand corner, upper right corner of the Temple Mount, you'll see a, a four cornered fortress there. You see that? Looks like a castle. That is the fortress Antonia. That's where Pilate had his headquarters. That was where the Roman garrison was. That's where they, Jesus was put on trial before Pilate. Um, so you have the temple, religious authority, and Fortress Antonia, Roman civil and military authority, right next to each other in Jesus' day. But as far as religious authority goes, there was, on, only, there was no question that was the Sanhedrin. It says chief priests, scribes, and elders. That's a description of different people making up this body. Elders of the city, 24 of them, and the chief priests were the members of the Sanhedrin, the scribes, and most likely temple guardsmen as well. There's sort of a delegation sent to figure out what this guy's up to. Now, while this is the group that confronts Jesus while he's teaching, what was he teaching? What was Jesus saying that got him in such hot water? We're not told. But by the way, this is the last time Jesus teaches until his death in the temple. This is the last time he openly teaches. I think he's teaching. And you remember what the first time Jesus realized who he was? Luke chapter 2. The boy Jesus, they can't find him. Remember the story? Why have you treated us like this, his mother says? Didn't you know I had to be my father's house? Same place, same temple. Now the last day of his teaching, I think he's teaching the gospel. I think he's teaching what we read about in Luke chapter 24, which is explaining to the people as he walked along the road, everything concerning himself, beginning with Moses and the law and the prophets, teaching about the good news of the kingdom of God, the grace of God made available in himself. There's a sad irony here, I think. Jesus is teaching the good news of, of God in himself, the gospel. And the religious leaders oppose it. The religious establishment opposes the good news of Jesus Christ. Of course, that would never happen today. I think, sadly, in some places, often, churches even, people who are supposed to be in the know, on the inside, are in opposition to what Jesus wants to do and say. And then they ask him this very ironic, this interesting question. They say, by what authority do you do these things? What things? Just the teaching? They're referring to more than the teaching. This is day three of his life. On day one, he comes in on the donkey. This is, he's fulfilling, and he knows this intentionally. We'll hear about this next week, the triumphal entry. Fulfilling the prophecy that the Messiah will ride in on the foal of a donkey. He allows people to lay down palm branches and shout Hosanna and sing praises to him and address him as Messiah. That's day one. On day two, he goes to the temple and turns over the tables of the money changers, drives them out. These are the things 
that he's been doing. Who do you think you are, in other words? What gives you the right? You shouldn't let people talk to you about you this way. You know you're not the Messiah. And how dare you upset order in the temple? Who do you think you are? This is the question he's being asked. By what authority? Now, specifically, they want to know who gave you this authority. Did you notice that, their question? Tell us, please, by what authority? Or who gave this authority to you? Because to the Jewish mind, authority always involved a who. It came from someone. Your father, your family line, your tribe, your heritage, your education, who you studied under, the approval of the Sanhedrin, the uh, favor of the high priest. There was always a who behind your authority. Jesus did not have the proper credentials, in other words. No permit, no license, no pass. Let's look now at the nature of authority. The nature of authority. Where does real, true authority come from? Does it come from titles, positions, elections, appointments? Well, certainly civilly and socially in our government and in our, in our culture, it does to a degree. But later, in, in Matthew chapter 7, by the way, Matthew 7, verses 28 and 29... Jesus teaches the people, and after he's done teaching them, the people, it says the people were astonished because he taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers or their scribes. What does that mean? What does it mean he taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers? Here's what he's saying there. For Jew Jewish rabbis taught based on the authority of the rabbi who taught them. So they were always quoting the rabbi who taught them. Or the rabbi who taught their rabbi. The rabbi who taught their rabbi who taught their rabbi. They were always quoting and basically repeating and expounding on the authority passed down to them from some other earthly teacher. Jesus never did this. In fact, that text, Matthew 7, is at the end of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has this string of places where he says, you've heard it said, but I tell you. He never says, but Rabbi so-and-so told me to tell you, or I learned this from Rabbi such-and-such. -such. He says, but I tell you, as one who had authority. Meaning, he didn't need someone else to tell him what to say. Now, I know I quote C.S. Lewis a lot, but he's not my authority. The word of God is. Jesus speaks as one who had authority, meaning in himself. He did not acquire it from somewhere. He did not learn it in a, in a classroom setting. He did not glean it from another rabbi or derive it. He simply had it. All other authority derives from him. He's the source. In John chapter 19, verse 11, there's this encounter between Jesus and Pilate. You remember this? And he goes, Pilate says, don't you know I have authority to put you to death or to pronounce you or give you life? Don't you know that? And what does Jesus say to him? You would have no authority at all if it were not given to you from my Father above. Meaning, you don't have any authority except that it comes from me. You know, today, I, I, I hear so much today, and I read articles and blogs and, uh, and research about how the church in America is losing ground, how the, the evangelical church in America is losing its influence. The church is losing its ability to speak into the culture. And there are many who claim the reason for this is because we're not relevant anymore. That the message of the church is, is dated. We haven't changed with the times. We haven't adapted the message uh, to meet the demands of a shifting individualistic and pluralistic and relativistic society. And therefore, it's, what we have to say is not that helpful, not that relevant in our society. Now, I'm not saying the church doesn't need to make its message relevant and the church doesn't need to change at times. But here's the point. The authority of the church in this culture or any culture is not derived from or founded on how popular it is, or how relevant it appears, or how palpable people feel it, they like it. The authority of the message of the church in any culture is founded on Jesus and his gospel. When the church stops preaching the gospel, it abdicates its authority. It gives it away. And that's true for us as individuals, by the way. The authority I have, if I have any as a pastor, is not because someone calls me pastor. It's because the community of faith has affirmed this call and it's under the authority of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The authority of you have in each other's lives to speak into each other's lives, to call out sin, to encourage repentance, to comfort, to challenge one another, to love each other in Christ. Sometimes there's a hard edge to love, you know. 
The authority you have to say, that's not right. God wants something more for you. Or let me pray for your forgiveness or for your healing. That's an exercise of authority you have under the gospel. It's only founded on the gospel. There is a vast difference between seeing Jesus as a religious genius or your spiritual life coach and seeing him as God in the flesh, the supreme authority over your life. Those are vastly different things, aren't they? Jesus is my life coach. He's my personal trainer spiritually. I go to him when I need something, and I might take his advice, I might not. That's not authority. That's precisely the issue at hand here in this confrontation. Let's look at the response to authority. We see that the question of authority, which comes to all of us, we see also the nature of authority. Let's look at the response. An encounter with true authority requires a response, even if it is a rejection of it. Notice the chief priests and the elders demand a response to their authority in the form of an answer to their question. Tell us, where'd you get this authority, Jesus? And Jesus' response is absolutely amazing. I love Jesus for many reasons. This is a minor one, but it's still a good reason to love him, the way he responds to this question. Look at verses 3 and 4 again of Luke 20. If you have your Bibles, Luke 20, verses 3 and 4. He answered them, I will ask, also ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Simple question. He answers a question with a question, which, by the way, is a neat trick whenever you're put on the spot. I don't think it works in school so much. I've tried this before. It doesn't really work. All right, professor, let me ask you a question, Mr. Smarty Pants, right? Or like if you're a little kid, why did you eat all the cookies, Jeffrey? Well, why did you leave them on the counter if you didn't want me to eat them, right? That never worked for me either. But Jesus is not trying to get out of it. I would, I would answer a question with a question to sort of evade it, to deflect it, you know. He's not trying to evade the question or get out of it. He's making a very specific and important point, and it's so important, important for us to understand this. The reason he asked this question about John's baptism is because the answer to that question is the answer to their question. Did you hear that? The answer to his question is the answer to their question. And they're smart enough to know where he's going with this. They get it. He's essentially saying, I want you to answer your own question. So I'll ask it to you differently. Let's look at the meaning of Jesus' question here. John's baptism. John, John the Baptist. you remember him? He was, the, all the people revered him as a true prophet from God. And the, and the Pharisees and scribes and the Sanhedrin had made no official pronouncement one way or the other about John. They just sort of let it go. And the common opinion was, this is a, this is a godly man, a voice of God in the wilderness. Everybody loved John. Now, John had said about Jesus what when Jesus came to be baptized? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Presumably, had the delegation from the Sanhedrin agreed that John's baptism was from heaven, then Jesus' next question would have been, well, then, what did he say about me? In other words, if you believe his, his baptism, which is a euphemism for his ministry, was from God, then you should believe what he said about me. So you tell me, in other words. But it doesn't get that far, does it? They have to huddle up. I love this. It's like, you ever watch Family Feud? When there's like three strikes up there, or two strikes up there, well, the third strike's coming, and they've got to get that question right, and you don't want to get the strike, and so they, they huddle up before they answer. Like, good answer, good answer. They all clap, you know. There's like a little huddle here. Oh, well, give us a minute, please, Jesus. And they huddle up, and they... they they debate. They realize, okay, look, if we, say from God, if we say from God, we know where that's going. That's a corner we don't want to be painted into. We can't say it's from heaven because we know where he's going with that. We don't like that. But if we say it's from just man, meaning John was no big deal, not a prophet, the crowds are not going to like that either. It's going to be very unpopular, bad for our poll numbers. Our ratings will go down. We might even be in trouble physically. They might get angry and attack us. This is not going to be good. We're in a tough spot here. We really can't answer one way or the other. Notice, they never once discuss what's true. They never once address what's the right answer. They never pray. They never seek God's direction. They have no concern at all for what's true, only for what will help their cause. Only for what's expedient and practical for them in the moment. Only it will serve their purposes. They have already dismissed Jesus as a phony. They've already judged him. 
They're questioned on a false premise to begin with. They don't believe he had any authority. And what do they finally come up with? I love this. What do they come up with? Uh, we don't know. Think about that. These are the, this is the delegation of the highest religious authority in the land. They're being asked a question about religious authority. Did you hear that? The highest religious authority in the land is being asked a question about religious authority. And they say, we don't know. How awesome is Jesus? He got him to admit it. Uh, we don't know. But the truth is they did know. They absolutely knew. It's not that they didn't know. The issue is they did not want to submit to his authority. They knew where this was going. The real issue in this situation and in many of our own hearts is not a matter of the intellect. It's a matter of the will. The issue of authority is not one of information. It's not an intellectual question. It's a question of the will. It's a question of surrender. People don't generally, in my experience, get argued into surrendering their lives to the authority of Jesus. Fine, you're smarter than me. I give up. I'll surrender. It doesn't work like that. It's an issue of the heart and of the will. Famous novelist, essayist, and atheist, Aldous Huxley. Some of you may know about him. Some of you may not. Either way, he wrote in an essay called Ends and Means this about his own uh, rejection of the Christian faith or any faith in at all. I had motives for wanting the world to have meaning, to have no meaning, excuse me. He says, I had motives for wanting the world to have no meaning. And consequently, I assumed it had none. For myself, the philosophy of meaninglessness and disbelief in God was essentially the instrument of my liberation, both sexual and political. What a statement. Do you hear that? I had reasons to want there to be no God. And so I chose that view and backed it up. In other words, I started with that premise because I wanted it to be true. And my disbelief in God was the instrument of my liberation, sexually and politically. What did he mean by that? He meant I will not surrender to the will of another. I want to do what I want. I don't want my life to come underneath another's authority. I want to exercise my own desires. And so I reject it. Now, he put it in plain terms, and at least he was honest. But this is what's happening here. We aren't going to answer you, Jesus, because we don't want to surrender. We don't want to be painted into that corner. We don't want to have to bow the knee. We don't want to submit to your authority. And in verse 8, the last verse, Jesus says what? Okay, then. Neither will I tell you where my authority comes from. If you won't answer me, I won't answer you. Essentially saying, if you will not recognize true authority, when it stares you in the face, then no amount of arguing is going to change that. If you can't see who's speaking to you, if you can't recognize in your mind and in your heart real divine authority when it stands in front of you, then this question and answer thing is going to take us nowhere. No amount of arguing will get you to see. And the truth is, friends, you and I face the very same issue. The question of authority is not just a question for them long ago. It's a question for us. I'm asking you, whose authority are you under? Oh, you have a boss at work. You have civil authorities. I mean, spiritually speaking. I mean, for the direction of your life, for the way you treat people, the decisions you make, and how you spend your money and your time. Whose authority are you under? It's got to be someone's. Perhaps it's just yours. That's a scary and destructive place to be. You trust yourself that much? To live your life under your own authority? You think that's true freedom? You think that's the path to liberation and fulfillment? Many do. By what authority do you live your life? This is what it means to be a Christian, a Christ follower. It doesn't mean to believe in a vague way that he existed. It doesn't mean to believe that, you know, that Jesus uh, you know, is, 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 existed once upon a time and that he actually died on a cross. Those are just intellectual beliefs. It means knowing those things to submit your life under his authority. It's not just to claim Jesus' name when you score a touchdown or when you, things are going great in your life. 
It's not just, you know, uh, to, to claim to follow him when, when, it, when it's convenient for you. It means to say, his will, not mine. It means to say that on a daily basis. It means when you're angry with your wife, to say, I don't get to have my way. What do you want with me, for me, God? It means you're irritated with your moronic husband. To say, you gave us to each other, God. It's when we were tempted at work to cut a corner. To say, I'm, under, I'm, under, I'm not under my authority. I can't make that choice. I don't have that right. The Apostle Paul got this right when he said, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. He's speaking about sexual morality, but it applies to every area of your life. You are not your own. To be a Christian means I, I don't belong to me. I belong to him. He calls the shots. I'm not saying I always live that way, but I'm saying that's the call of my life. Let me read Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19 for you as we get ready to wrap up here. This is the famous place where after Jesus has been resurrected and ascend, before he ascends to heaven, he speaks to his disciples gathered together and he says in verse 19, and Jesus came to them and said, or 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God's given me all authority. So what, do I, what does Jesus do with it? He confers it on you and me to go and make disciples. What's a disciple? Those who come under his authority with their lives. God's given me all authority and I'm giving it to you. Why? To go and help people know that the only path to true freedom is to live underneath my authority. All authority. Make disciples. Friends, I would say it this way. If Jesus has not confronted you with the question of his authority, if he's not flipped over the tables of your life, you know? If you've never felt him rearranging stuff and challenging stuff and calling stuff out, if, you've never, if he's never made you feel uncomfortable at all, I would suggest you've not met him. You've met your idea of him. But never forget, the same Jesus who confronts us with a, a question of his authority and whether or not we'll surrender to it, that's the Jesus who laid his authority down to go to the cross. You know that beautiful place in Philippians 2 where the Apostle Paul says that Jesus emptied himself, humbled himself, made himself nothing, surrendered his divine authority? You know, when those, when those measly scribes and Pharisees and teachers of the law and elders come up to him, he could have gone, I'll show you authority. Boom, they all drop. That's probably what I would have done. But it's a good thing I'm not Jesus. He doesn't do that. He's gentle and humble in his use of authority. He, he uses his authority to serve others. And the ultimate example is the cross. The authority and power of Jesus took him to the cross, not to crush us, but to liberate us, to set us free. I'll finish by asking the, the question one time again. The question of authority is for all of us. So by whose authority? Jesus asks you, by whose authority do you live your life? Let's pray. Father, we confess that we often live under our own authority or for the wrong authorities. But thank you for this amazing message that the only true, liberating, loving authority is yours. Help us, by your grace, to surrender to it. We pray in your name. Amen.